to this PERFORM Colloquium. My name is Karen Lee. I'm from the Department of Psychology at Concordia, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Jason Neva. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Physical Activity Sciences at UDM. He also has affiliations with the Institut de Gériatrie de Montréal and Réseau de Bioimagerie du Québec. Uh, and Dr. Neva earned his PhD at the University of Waterloo in the Kinesiology Department in Richard Stain's lab group. And there he was concentrating on neuroplasticity mechanisms relating to motor training and aerobic exercise. He then went on to UBC uh, at Vancouver for postdoctoral fellowship at uh, UBC Physical Therapy, where he worked with Dr. Lara Boyd, who I know uh, has been a PERFORM uh, colloquium speaker in the past. Um, and there he focused on neurorehabilitation in clinical populations, such as Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, Dr. Neva's research papers can be found in very well-respected journals such as uh, Restorative Neurology and Neuroscience, Behavioral Brain Research, and Movement Disorders. His program of research is supported by um, NSERC, Natural Sciences Engineering Research Council, and focuses on the priming of motor learning through acute bouts of exercise and neuroplasticity using repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. I believe he'll be telling us about some of this work specifically in his presentation today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Neva. Over to you, Jason. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me to this colloquium. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here virtually with you guys. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this again soon in person. I'm just trying to start my presentation. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Uh, yes, so thanks very much for that introduction. And I will indeed be talking about some of those topics that, uh, that Karen mentioned. Um, specifically, I will be talking about my uh, previous and uh, present and future work uh, on neuroplasticity, motor learning, and exercise and implications for in rehabilitation as well. I'll focus on. Um, so my, my research interest could be summed up by this sentence that's really at the top, which Karen nicely introduced for me as well, which is seeking to further understand the neuroplasticity mechanisms supporting motor learning. And my research is motivated by evidence pointing to a common mechanism uh, that underlies both motor skill learning in healthy individuals and relearning of motor function after neurological conditions like after stroke and in other neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease as well. And of course, this common mechanism that I'm very interested in is neuroplasticity and neuroplasticity uh, being the ability of the brain to form and reorganize itself. So what I'll talk about today is my field of interest and my research streams. And then also within each of these research streams, a project or two. Uh, that I've been uh, recently that I've recently completed or I'm currently working on. So the, the general field of uh, of my interest is, like I said, to enhance and transfer the knowledge of the central nervous system mechanisms underlying motor learning. My research involves uh, three streams, which span from fundamental neuroscience to application and rehabilitation as well. And the three research streams include investigation of the central nervous system mechanisms that underlie or support motor learning and control, the impact of interventions such as acute exercise and repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, but we'll focus today mostly on acute exercise. And then in my applied research stream, I seek to apply this gained knowledge to improve motor function in healthy older individuals or in aging and people with Parkinson's disease to improve their motor function and to improve rehabilitation uh, of motor function after stroke. And particularly, I'm interested in the rehabilitation of the upper limbs, as, as I'll talk about in my talk. And for all of my uh, research that I'm talking about, mostly all of it, I'll be focusing on the use of transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS for short, to both measure and modulate brain excitability in order to answer 
in scientific uh, research questions and, and my research streams. So I'll begin with my first fundamental research stream, underlying the, uh, sorry, investigating the underlying mechanisms of motor learning and motor control. Um, <clears throat> so our ability to produce goal-directed movement, learn novel motor skills, and adapt these skills to new and challenging environments is essential to our daily lives. It's how we interact with the world around us. And here are a number of examples of, uh, of daily tasks that we're all used to, and maybe some of us like me or consider ourselves amateur musicians, so I consider that a very important point. But the point is, is these are all tasks that take advantage, of course, of motor learning and motor control. Now, just to define these terms, motor control is the regulation of movement by a central nervous system, for those of us who are lucky, to have, uh, lucky enough to have a central nervous system. And motor control involves voluntary movements and reflexes. Motor learning, on the other hand, although it's part of motor control, is not so easily defined. And actually, those of us in, in the motor learning world don't always agree on the precise definition of it. Um, but one that I've, one definition that I've come across recently that I quite like is uh, motor learning is the process by which movements are performed better, quicker, and or more accurately than before. And one thing I'd like to add on top of that is that these improvements in performance uh, should be relatively permanent in order to truly call it motor learning. And what I mean by that is that we need to show an improvement in a skill that we initially learned at a later time or date in order to truly call it motor learning and not just improvement in performance. <clears throat> so gathering evidence over the last few decades uh, demonstrates that there are activity changes or neuroplasticity uh, that occurs in many brain areas uh, to support the process of motor learning. Uh, basically what I'm showing you in this graph here is that most areas in the brain are involved in the motor learning process. And just because, you know, for example, the visual cortex and the temporal cortex aren't colored or highlighted here doesn't mean that they're not also involved because they certainly are. But the one point I want to emphasize is that there seems to be one area that's vital through all uh, stages of motor learning, all processes of motor learning, and that being the primary motor cortex. So uh, the, the idea that the primary motor cortex, or M1 for short, is just the output of uh, of our brain in order to make our muscles move, and it's just solely for that, is now out the window, and, and we know that it's involved a lot more in motor learning and motor control processes. Uh, however, our knowledge is still lacking uh, as to how the brain, and in particular, how the motor cortex is involved in relatively simple motor control and more complex motor learning processes. So, as I mentioned before, my work largely uses transcranial like magnetic stimulation, or again, TMS for short, uh, which is a very powerful method uh, in order to measure and modulate the excitability of the brain. And the way that TMS works, as I'm showing, which I hope you can see the, uh, the uh, drawing here that should, that should show up, the way that TMS works is we hold a small stimulating coil over uh, the brain or over the, the scalp, and when it's engaged, it, it uh, produces an electromagnetic field that crosses the skull and allows us to be able to stimulate the neurons of the brain, non-invasively. And when we hold this small stimulating coil over the motor cortex and we stimulate its neurons, it sends descending volleys of activity down the corticospinal output neuron, down the corticospinal axon that eventually reaches the target peripheral muscles. And that creates a quick, brief muscle contraction in the target muscle. And these, this quick, brief muscle contraction can be picked up by surface electromyography and shows up as a clear waveform known as the motor evoked potential. And I'll just play this video here. This is me performing TMS to a colleague of mine. I'm not sure you can hear the sound, but it's not so, so important, I suppose, if you can't. Um, but what, if you focus on the individual's hand, there's a single pulse of TMS over the motor cortex, and then you can see their hand actually move and contract and we pick up that there's the surface electromyography I'll play it again and if you can see the contrast isn't so great so I apologize for that but on the computer screen on this laptop screen you can see a motor evoked potential that looks very much like this so that's just showing uh, showing what we can do with TMS so I really like TMS because uh, a big advantage of it is we can 
quantify the size of this motor vote potential and, and use it in many different ways in order to assess the excitability of the brain. And we can use these various kind of measures of the motor vote potential to give us a surrogate biomarker of neuroplasticity before and after uh, uh, exercise, for example, before and after we learn a motor task, things like this, we can use TMS in health to understand the functioning of the brain and in neurological conditions like after stroke, for example, to understand how it's damaged. So specifically regarding uh, the underlying neural mechanisms of motor skill practice and learning, what's been found so far is that cortical spinal excitability changes with motor uh, skill practice. And specifically, what's been found in the literature so far is that when we practice motor skills, uh, for example, with our upper limb, <clears throat> uh, we have an increase in motor evoked potential amplitude. So the size of these motor evoked potential amplitudes are increased. And what uh, that has been interpreted as in previous literature is an increased M1 plasticity. So these, th this is our surrogate measure of neuroplasticity. Increase in motor evoked potential amplitudes equals increase M1 plasticity. However, uh, on the other hand, uh, other research has found when we practice motor skills that there's a decrease in motor evoked potential amplitudes. And that has also been interpreted as an increase in, an increase in motor cortex plasticity, which they seem contradictory, uh, of course, but they can both be true, uh, in, in my opinion, at, at the same time, uh, certainly. But the, the main point is, is that uh, corticospinal modulations in corticospinal excitability are thought to be associated with motor skill processes, motor skill learning processes, rather than the execution of simple motor control or mere repetitive movement for the most part. Yet, as other research also shows that repetitive movement practice, not necessarily involving skill learning, like just a, a, performing abduction or adduction thumb movements, for example, can also modulate corticospinal excitability in these motor evoked potentials to a similar degree and extent to motor skill practice. So therefore, uh, the, the knowledge, the current knowledge is, is somewhat lacking and are somewhat contradictory about how the motor cortex can be involved in both motor learning and motor control processes simultaneously. And there are several reasons why I think that this is the case, but one that I have been quite interested in in the last two, uh, three years and that I'm, I'm continuing to pursue is um, the research hasn't considered the role necessarily too much of the role of unique interneurons uh, within M1 and the role that they may play in the, in the processes of motor control and motor learning. Uh, so, so there may be, uh, which I'll, I'll talk more about, these, these unique interneurons. So unique interneurons within the motor cortex itself that may play a role in motor learning and motor control. And the, the study that, I'm, uh, that I'll show you that I'm setting up investigated uh, how the primary motor cortex could code for both motor control and motor learning simultaneously. So in order to examine this specific question, I took advantage, advantage of recent advances in transcranial magnetic simulation research and technology uh, in order to show that distinct sets of motor cortex interneurons can be measured by altering the TMS current direction in the brain. And what I'm showing you with this schematic here is that even though when we use a single pulse of TMS uh, over the motor cortex, we, we get this motor evoked potential that results. We get a single motor evoked potential, but we're likely activating all kinds of different uh, interneuron sets within the motor cortex itself. So what I'm showing you here in this schematic is that there are, uh, that recent TMS research has identified at least two uh, distinct interneuron sets that both interact with cortical spinal output neurons in the brain that finally send the signal out to make our muscles contract, but likely in different ways. We can specifically activate or preferentially activate, I should say, these, this one set of interneurons using a, the traditional posterior to anterior TMS current. And this is what's typically used in most of the research uh, up to date. And, and um, and by what I mean by posterior to anterior TMS current is from uh, a current that goes from the back to the front of, of the brain over the motor cortex. Um, and I'll, I'll refer to these interneurons as PA sensitive interneurons. And we can activate this other set of interneurons shown in blue by reversing the TMS current or reversing the coil around to go in the anterior to posterior current direction from the front to the back 
of the head. And I'll refer to these as AP sensitive interneurons. So not only are there uh, different neurophysiological characteristics that we've discovered with these different interneuron, interneuron sets, but these interneurons also have unique relationships to certain behaviors as well. For example, these PA sensitive interneurons seem to be more associated with repetitive task practice, not necessarily involved in, uh, with a high level of skill. And these AP sensitive interneurons seem to be the slightly more uh, unique and perhaps interesting ones, at least for now, where they seem to be associated more with preparation of movement, preparation of choice reaction time, for example. Uh, they seem to be more involved with attention and adaptation to uh, adaptation task practice, tasks that involve a little bit more complex uh, skill to them. To date, though, no study has tested how these interneurons may differentially change due to skilled motor practice. Uh, uh, and my hypothesis was that these particular uh, unique interneurons differentially impact uh, motor learning versus motor control. So how I performed this study was I used, of course, transcranial magnetic stimulation over the primary, uh, dominant primary motor cortex. I took these measures before, during, and after motor skill practice. I recorded these measures from the abductor pollicis brevis that was trained. The abductor pollicis brevis is just the, uh, the thumb muscle. And this particular measure that I focused on that I'll uh, explain to you is, is a paired pulse version of TMS called short interval intercortical inhibition. And this is a little, little bit different than the measure that I shared with you earlier uh, at the beginning with the video uh, of my colleague. Well, we compare that type of TMS, which is a single pulse of TMS, to give us the size of NAP, which we call test stimulus. And we compare that to paired pulse TMS, which is two pulses in very quick succession, like two milliseconds apart, that uh, follows this conditioning stimulus uh, plus a test stimulus format. And the main point here is that we, what results is a smaller motor of vocal tension compared to just the single pulse of TMS. And what we do is we take a ratio and we get a percentage of motor cortex inhibition when we compare these two different uh, types of uh, single pulse and paired pulse TMS. So this gives us a sense of motor cortex inhibition. And I took these measures both in the PA and AP sensitive current directions to understand the role of these different interneurons. And how I distinguished between uh, motor learning, or how I attempted to, to uh, distinguish between motor learning and motor control is the use of this motor task called the continuous tracking task. Uh, this continuous tracking task, I have people come in the lab and hopefully you can see the animation going now. Um, <clears throat> have people come into the lab and perform abduction and adduction thumb movements controlling a joystick that, uh, that made upwards and downwards movements of a cursor, where on one occasion they were tracking a complex but always repeating sequence that could be predicted and learned, whereas on another occasion they came and did essentially the exact same uh, task except that the sequences were always random so that they could never be practiced excuse me, predicted or learned. And I associated this random pra uh, sequence practice with motor control and the repeated sequence practice that you could predict and learn with motor learning. So what we found with this task is not, wasn't so surprising to us. Uh, it, we found that there was an increased performance at the repeated sequence practice task that could be predicted and learned. So uh, to orient you to this graph, on the y-axis we have time lag, in milliseconds with higher values indicating better performance and lower values indicating worse performance. Higher values just mean that uh, they are tracking the target more closely <clears throat> in, in this task. And on the x-axis we have the number of blocks of practice over time. So what we see here is that there is a decrease of increase in performance which is actually a decrease in time lag for the repeated sequence practice task that's maintained 24 hours later uh, which uh, uh, through this retention test, we can see that they actually did learn this particular task, and that demonstrates motor learning for the repeated sequence practice task, but not the random sequence practice task. They didn't improve that, that one at all. So in contrast to our behavioral results, our, our neurophysiological findings were a little bit different. So first, we found a decrease in this PA-sensitive uh, SICI, short interval intercortical inhibition for both practice sequences. I'll show you what I mean by explaining the graph. On the y-axis, we have a percent 
unconditioned stimulus where higher values indicate decreased inhibition, lower values indicate increased inhibition. And on the x-axis, we have the time points of TMS measurement. So in this uh, study, we did a, a, a baseline and a pre-measurement intervened by um, at just 10 minutes of rest to make sure that these measures were stable, it was kind of a double baseline. And then we took these measures 10 minutes after practice and, and 20 minutes after practice as well. So what we found, uh, what you can see here, is that there was a similar decrease in inhibition in this PA-sensitive measure for both repeated and random practice, uh, very similarly. In contrast to that, with the AP-sensitive uh, short interval intercortical SICI measure, we found a decrease only for repeated sequence practice. So in this graph, we have the exact same Y and X axes, except the results are quite different, where we have all the way to 20 minutes post-practice, we see a continued decrease in inhibition in this AP-sensitive measure, whereas the random practice returns back down to baseline. So we see just a decrease in AP excitability due to repeated sequence practice. So in this study, I believe that uh, I've confirmed and extended the evidence that there are these different sets of interneurons within the primary motor cortex, and that we can assess them non-invasively with transcranial magnetic stimulation. And uh, specifically, I believe this study has uh, uncovered a few novel things. First, that these AP interneurons, AP sensitive interneurons, respond to motor learning, and specifically uh, in regard to my study, sequence motor learning. Whereas these AP sensitive interneurons respond to motor control, regardless of sequence, regardless if they practice the sequence that they could learn or they practice the sequence that they could not. And I believe the, the combination of these findings demonstrate and give us a, a sense of how M1 could simultaneously code for both motor control and motor learning, answering that kind of conundrum uh, I introduced before. So that's it for the first stream of my research. On to my second one, uh, which is examining the impact of interventions such as acute exercise on motor learning and neuroplasticity. So this theme of research is motivated by my work as well as others demonstrating the beneficial effects of acute exercise on motor learning and neuroplasticity as well. And specifically the type of exercise that I've used and that I'll, that I'll um, refer to for the rest of the talk for the most part is an acute bout of lower limb cycling exercise on a stationary bike that lasts about 20 minutes in duration and is moderate to vigorous in, in intensity. And then for the motor learning tasks, generally, for the most part, I use motor learning tasks that involve the non-exercised upper limbs. And this is true also of the TMS measures that I'll show you as well. We take the measures of the non-exercised upper limbs after we do a bout of exercise with the lower limbs in order to see the, because the goal of all of this work was to see the possible clinical application to individuals uh, to, uh, with stroke, for example, to improve their uh, upper limb uh, training. So in a recently published study, I found that exercise increases motor adaptation, this uh, particular type of motor learning that I'll explain, and interlimb transfer that I'll also explain as well. Um, and in this study, we had young healthy participants practice a visual reaching task on the king arm robot manipulandum. And I had uh, young healthy people first practice a visual familiarization reaching task where I hope you can see the video that's playing now um, where I'm showing that people first practice to uh, reaching from a center target to visual targets that were centered all around the clock essentially from the center target with aligned visual feedback. Um, so the, and, and to point out the participants could not see their hand or their arm or, or that blue bar uh, that represents the actual uh, robot, but they can only see the targets and that white circular cursor that represents their, uh, their hand position. So that was the familiarization task. And then afterwards, we had people perform the bout of acute leg cycling exercise or a bout of rest for control. And then after this, we had individuals perform the visual motor rotation task to assess motor adaptation. And I'll just play this video as I explain it. The visual motor rotation task is quite a robust task that's used in the motor learning and motor adaptation literature, where if you can see the video, 
uh, what we do is we systematically rotate the cursor. In this case, it's going veering off counterclockwise to the um, uh, veering off counterclockwise about the center target systematically. So what you can see is that with initial exposure to this task, people have a lot of trouble. And then after about, I'll just pause that video there. I'll pause these videos too. Um, after practice, 60, 80, 100 trials, depends on the individual, they adapt quite, quite well. And it's actually quite rapid. It's quite a robust task where now individuals are actually reaching, in this case, uh, counterclockwise 45 degrees in order to make the cursor go to that target. And then immediately after they adapted to the visual motor, motor rotation task, I had people practice the same task with the left arm, the untrained arm, to assess interlimb transfer. And then the interlimb transfer is the phenomenon by which when we learn a certain task, for example, with one upper limb, like with our right hand, we can transfer that, a certain portion of that skill and that learning to the opposite untrained hand so that we're performing better with the untrained hand than we would have if we never practiced the task at all with the right hand. And then uh, to test motor adaptation learning, we had individuals come back 24 hours later to do a retention test with both the right and the left arms. And what we found was that exercise improved reaching accuracy. We found a small but significant increase in skill acquisition at, at initial adaptation to that task. And we also found a small but significant increase in right arm retention as well at this task. And this graph on the y-axis is peak lateral displacement, where uh, lower values indicate that they are reaching more straight, more accurately to the target. But we, never, we didn't find any effect of interlimb transfer or retention with the left arm with, uh, with the reaching accuracy measure. We also found that exercise decreased reaction time quite a bit more robustly, actually. So we found the significant uh, improvement in skill acquisition with decreased reaction times after exercise. And we also found an increase in interlimb transfer shown by a decreased reaction time uh, after exercise and after exercise followed by the vision motor adaptation task. But we didn't find any effects 24 hours later in this case. So additionally, a large portion of my work has investigated the question of how exactly does the brain, it does exercise improve motor learning? And by that, I mean, what are exactly the changes that are occurring due to a bout of exercise in the brain itself? So although there's evidence that exercise enhances activity in planning and, and, and executive function regions, which I believe my, my previous research also um, confirms that, I also believe that there were changes happening in the primary motor cortex when I started this work. So, um, and, and whether they were happening in the motor cortex themselves or whether these areas, these frontal areas were feeding into the motor cortex after exercise. So I began this work looking specifically at the effects to the primary motor cortex after exercise. So myself and my colleagues were the first uh, uh, among other researchers to show that an acute bout of leg cycling exercise actually decreases intracortical inhibition in the primary motor cortex, and specifically the, uh, of the non-exercised upper limb muscle. There we go. Um, so this is the exact same measure, uh, the short interval intracortical inhibition measure that I uh, told you before, that I talked about before with the motor learning task. So what we found is that this same measure actually decreases in its amount of inhibition immediately after, or five minutes post after exercise, but significantly so 20 minutes post exercise. So this particular study too is just one example of many that we've shown that this particular measure actually is decreased or there's a release of inhibition after exercise within the motor cortex. And we've also shown it with several other measures of inhibition. So it's quite a, quite a robust finding that we found here and continue to find as well. On the other hand, uh, myself and my colleagues also showed that exercise does not seem to change corticospinal output excitability. And you can measure the, the excitability of the corticospinal system with the typical single pulse uh, TMS method that I showed you at the very beginning in the video. And what, and what we, uh, you can do these particular measures before and after exercise, again, in a very similar way with the non-exercised upper limb muscle. We took these measures in the same study that I showed you before, and we've shown this actually uh, over and over again, that before or pre-exercise and post-exercise, shown in these different colors, 
that exercise that MEP amplitude does not increase or change after exercise specifically. So all the knowledge to date though uh, on that note has not considered the role of interneurons within the primary motor cortex and the role that they play and how they're impacted by acute exercise. All the TMS measures that have been taken so far have been in uh, using the traditional PA sensitive direction. <clears throat> in this study, it was my hypothesis that if the, the specific interneurons, specifically the AP interneurons, are the ones that change due to motor learning and that exercise enhances motor learning, then it follows logically to me that AP sensitive interneurons would underlie the neural and behavioral effects of acute exercise. And this is, was exactly uh, our hypothesis going into the study. So just to confirm our previous findings, we took these same single pulse measures of TMS, of motor evoked potential amplitudes, in the PA sensitive direction before and after exercise. What we did is we did a double baseline again, intervened by a period of 25 minutes of rest. We took these measures, two time points, then we had people exercise and took the measures uh, immediately after exercise and 30 minutes after exercise as well. And we found that uh, confirming our previous work that there's no effect of PA sensitive excitability after exercise. Now, on the other hand, we found that there was an increase in AP sensitive excitability, reversing that current to go in the opposite direction. And particularly, this effect seems to be happening at 30 minutes post exercise. And to be honest, I don't really know why, but uh, there seems to be gathering evidence that the effects of exercise seem to be a little bit delayed um, and not necessarily immediate, but interesting nonetheless. So to try to attempt to answer this question, how does exercise improve motor learning? Well, so far from the evidence of, of several studies of mine and others, it seems to point to that exercise induces a decreased motor cortex inhibition at the level of the cortex. I've shown some evidence now too that there's unique M1 interneurons that likely play a role, these AP sensitive interneurons. Most work, but not all, but most seem to show that corticospinal output excitability doesn't seem to change, nor does uh, spinal excitability, uh, the excitability at the level of the spine, that doesn't seem to change either. So why are these, uh, these uh, effects important? Well, the, particularly this decreased motor cortex inhibition has been shown to be very important for rapid neuroplasticity to occur. This decreased M1 inhibition is also very important for early motor learning stages. So, uh, so I've shown also with these unique M1 interneurons. And recovery of function after stroke, is, it's very important to decrease the amount of inhibition after stroke as well because excessively high levels of inhibition have been associated with poor motor function after stroke. So there's a lot of application of this, this research, I believe. Um, and now to my, uh, to my applied research stream. And I'll begin with my work on healthy aging individuals. I'll just share one study on exercise and, and neuroplasticity. Um, so healthy aging is associated with a decreased ability to modulate cortical inhibition. These exact same measures that I've been talking about uh, that are modulated due to exercise. And the uh, poorer control of these cortical inhibition me measures in healthy, uh, in, in healthy aging is associated with poorer fine motor control particularly. Therefore, so in this study, I, I hypothesized that cortical inhibition circuits would be modulated after exercise similarly to younger healthy people. However, uh, as it turns out, we did these measures similar, similar uh, experimental setup. As you can already tell by the title, exercise increases cortical spinal output excitability. So we, I actually found the opposite of what we um, hypothesized and quite strongly and robustly as well. So on the y-axis, we have corticospinal excitability, these measures of motor evoked potentials with higher values indicating greater excitability. And what we find, we had in the study uh, different or separate groups, people who performed this bout of exercise, and we did these measures before and after, and people who did a bout of rest. Um, and we did these measures before and after. And you can see in the exercise group that there's a significant increase immediately after exercise and at 30 minutes post-exercise, and uh, quite robustly too. So we see that cortical spinal output excitability is increased due to exercise in healthy older people. And we didn't find this same effect with cortical, these cortical inhibition measures that I mentioned before. 
so what it seems, at least this study so far, one of the only studies that have, uh, that have studied this in healthy older people, is that acute exercise affects cortical excitability differently across the lifespan. So this is true. And now, um, and now on to the third applied research stream where I'll discuss uh, the effects of exercise and neuroplasticity in people with Parkinson's disease as well. And this just includes one study as well. <clears throat> so Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder that's marked by certain symptoms like bradykinesia, instability, tremor, and rigidity. Parkinson's disease is unique in that it seems to target uh, deep areas of the brain, specifically dopamine, produ uh, dopamine producing deep areas of the brain known as the basal ganglia and specifically, more specifically, the, the substantia, substantia niagara. However, uh, more and more research is indicating that not, these areas are not only affected after, uh, during, excuse me, Parkinson's disease, but also the motor cortices and somatosensory cortices, but, all, but particularly the motor cortex. And people with Parkinson's disease show diminished motor cortex neuroplasticity and also abnormal motor cortex excitability as well. So, but the good news is, is that uh, aerobic exercise may be a, a viable method in order to improve Parkinson's related symptoms and also perhaps to uh, normalize these abnormal kind of motor cortex effects that we see in people with Parkinson's disease as well. However, there are very few studies that have investigated the impact of it aerobic exercise training program on cortical excitability and motor function in individuals with PD. And even less have actually investigated the effects of an acute bout of exercise, but this study specifically had, was designed to test the impact of a three-month aerobic exercise training program on specifically motor skill practice tasks, actually the same task that I, that I introduced to you in the first study, and also cortical spinal excitability as measured by transcranial magnetic stimulation. So we did these measures before and after a three month aerobic exercise training program or a three month control stretching program in individuals with Parkinson's disease. And these individuals with Parkinson's disease had mild to moderate symptoms, signs and symptoms, excuse me, and then the, how the, uh, they were divided into either the aerobic exercise or the stretching group, which occurred in a group setting and uh, occurred three times per week in that three month period. That, and, and each session lasted about 30 minutes to an hour. And the exercise that they performed on a stationary bike was moderate to vigorous in intensity. So what I found was initially surprising, but it shouldn't be at this point, given the healthy older data that I showed you but it was initially surprising because we found that exercise maintains corticospinal excitability in people with Parkinson's disease. In fact, it may not just maintain it, it might actually increase it a little bit. So I'll explain what I mean by, by this finding. Um, on the y-axis, we have MEP amplitude with higher values indicating greater corticospinal excitability, and then we have stimulus intensity on the y-axis. And what we see before to after the three-month intervention, whether it's control or exercise, um, we see that there's a change, and particularly the control group, which is the stretching group, seem to decrease their, um, their cortical spinal excitability measures, whereas exercise seemed to increase, and particularly the significant effect comes out at the higher stimulus intensities. So exercise either maintains or even increases cortical spinal excitability in people with Parkinson's disease. And what we also found was that exercise decreases cortical inhibition, this I, I did expect, and increased motor skill performance, performance as well. So this decreased cortical inhibition was shown by this measure, short interval intercortical inhibition, the same measure that I've shown you before, where we have on the y-axis here the change in this inhibition measure uh, before and after the three-month program. And what we find, and uh, with values higher indicating less inhibition and lower values indicating more inhibition. And so what we see is that the people who perform the acute, uh, excuse me, the aerobic exercise program decrease their amount of inhibition within their motor cortex. And then also the, the same individuals significantly improve their performance at this motor skill task where we have time lag 
on the y-axis where higher values indicate better performance. And indeed, people in the aerobic exercise group improved their performance significantly at this task. So although this is only one study, I believe these results are at least promising to demonstrate that a longer term aerobic exercise program can improve skilled motor performance and perhaps normalize corticospinal excitability or at least maintain it uh, over time for individuals with Parkinson's disease. And now uh, I'll finally finish with my applied work on, uh, with individuals with stroke. So my applied research uh, with stroke focuses on how cortical resources associated with planning, executive function, and sensory feedback can contribute to recovery of function following stroke. Specifically how these particular regions interact with the motor cortex after middle cerebral artery stroke that of course affects the motor cortex. So after damage to the brain due to stroke, which, uh, which is what happens when an artery uh, has a loss of oxygen and blood to the brain, and, and this results in uh, brain tissue damage. And here I'm showing an example of the right stroke affected region to the right hemisphere. What typically happens after this is the opposite side of the body or the contralateral side of the body decreases, uh, is decreasing its motor functioning such that the upper limbs and lower limbs to varying degrees are, are more impaired. And this of course depends on where exactly the stroke occurs, how big the volume of the stroke affected area, uh, etc. Importantly, uh, approximately 85% of Canadians live with persistent impairments into the chronic phase of stroke. So this is a, this is a big problem that we need to tackle. Um, <clears throat> much of the clinical neurophysiological research to measure and modulate the brain after stroke has been motivated by this, the interhemispheric competition model, which I'll briefly explain here. Well, so what we typically see after stroke, stroke-related damage here, is that there's, of course, decreased motor function on the opposite side of the body, and there's decreased cortical activity in the stroke-affected um, area of the brain. But the interhemispheric competition uh, posits that there's, because there's increased cortical activity on the opposite side of the brain, and particularly because there's increased interhemispheric inhibition that's acting towards the stroke-affected region from the non-stroke-affected region, all of this put together leads to poorer motor function after stroke, and particularly the increased interhemispheric uh, inhibition. <clears throat> so along with uh, several others in the field, uh, I've, I've attempted to investigate the use of repetitive TMS, uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, in order to mitigate these changes after stroke, in order to counteract the interhemispheric competition model. And um, repetitive TMS is different than the TMS that I talked about before, where you can use single pulse and paired pulse TMS to measure the excitability of the brain. Instead, repetitive TMS can be used in repetitive trains, quick repetitive trains or slow repetitive trains in order to either decrease or increase the excitability of the brain for a period of time. So in the stroke literature, inhibitory repetitive TMS is particularly used to counteract the interhemispheric competition model in order to decrease the overactive contralesional hemisphere, that's the opposite side of the brain, in hopes to decrease the amount of ongoing inhibition acting on the stroke affected hemisphere, thereby increasing its cortical activity and leading to better motor function. This is at least uh, the, the way that uh, the literature was moving towards counteracting or attempting to counteract the interhemispheric competition model. And so uh, in a recently published study, I, I attempted to, we attempted to do this exact thing by pairing tr uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation to the contralesional motor cortex followed by heretic motor practice in order to take advantage of this decreased amount of inhibition that, that uh, we, we thought would occur and perhaps is occurring. Um, so in this study, we had five sessions of inhibitory repetitive TMS to the contralesional motor cortex or a sham, which is fake stimulation for a control, followed by motor skill practice of the heretic lip. And I'll just play this video here uh, of, of, to give you an example of the task that we had people do. So instead of the uh, vision motor adaptation task I showed you before, this was simply a task that 
uh, people with stroke use the parotid limb and reach the visual targets in a particular sequence in order to get them to use their parotid limb. And we did pre-motor function and motor skill, uh, pre and post motor function and motor skill clinical and motor skill um, assessments at this task after the five sessions of the intervention. And unfortunately, what we found was that inhibitory repetitive TMS to the contralesional motor cortex showed no improvement. Specifically, there was no additional improvement to motor function as shown by the Wolf motor function test, a clinical measure of upper limb function after stroke. And also there was no additional increase or improvement to motor learning at that motor task that I was just showing you due to the contralesional inhibitory repetitive TMS. So what this work suggests, uh, and, and along with several others in the field, suggests that contralesional motor cortex suppression or, or inhibition may not be the best solution for people with stroke, or it may not apply to everybody. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of stroke rehabilitation research using repetitive TMS over the motor cortex shows a, a very minimal effect, in fact. And importantly, uh, what I'll emphasize here is that there's accumulating evidence that uh, executive function planning and sensory feedback regions can compensate or can come online for stroke-related damage to the motor cortex. And these really need to be, continue to be um, investigated as I, as I summarize in this, this book chapter that I'm showing you here. And as part of this work, uh, along with my collaborators, uh, I've shown that frontal white matter structural integrity is vital for motor function after stroke, particularly into the chronic phase after stroke. In this study, we had individuals uh, with chronic stroke come into the lab and go into the MRI scanner to do a diffusion tensor related imaging scan, uh, which is a measure of whole brain white matter microstructural integrity. And among other regions of interest, what, what I was particularly interested in is looking at the corpus callosum and looking at the particular subregions of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum being the structure that allows the two sides of the brain to communicate with one another. And it's particularly important to the interhemisphere competition model, for example. But I was very interested in the prefrontal, premotor, and motor regions of the corpus callosum to see um, how they influence motor impairments after stroke. And what we did, what we did was I, I drew these regions and uh, extracted the fractional anisotropy, which is a, a uh, which is a, gives a measure of structural integrity of the white matter from these frontal corpus callosum regions. And what we found was that with greater prefrontal corpus callosum integrity, uh, there was less motor impairment and better motor function in those with chronic stroke. Albeit this is a small sample, but it's still significant to me. And so this work not, not only shows that uh, brain structural integrity of the frontal and parietal regions, uh, of the frontal regions certainly are important after stroke, but the next study that I'll show you also shows that the brain function of these frontal and parietal regions are also critical um, after stroke as well, critical in the recovery of function after stroke. <clears throat> So this is the last study that I'll, that I'll share with you guys today. And in this research project, I measured interhemispheric connectivity, uh, connectivity between the two sides of the brain using the particular method of single pulse TMS called transclosal inhibition. And this particular method of TMS, what we do is we use a single pulse of TMS over, in this case, the right motor cortex while individuals are holding a contraction with their right <clears throat> and what this does is this sends an inhibitory signal through or via the corpus callosum to the opposite side of the brain, the active side of the brain, which results in a decrease or dip in ongoing voluntary EMG activity resulting in an ipsilateral silent period. And we can quantify this ipsilateral silent period to understand how the two sides of the brain are communicating with one another. And in the stroke literature, for example, this has been done over and over again in order to understand how the brain how the motor cortex of one side of the brain communicates with the motor cortex of the other side of the brain. But what hasn't been done before until this particular research project of mine was testing if this same inner hemispheric communication was elicited from frontal and parietal cortical regions. So I was particularly interested in seeing if this inner hemispheric communication occurred with stimulation from the, to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, dorsal premotor cortex, 
the primary somatosensory cortex and the parietal cortex as well. And what we found in our control group, uh, which was a little bit surprising at first actually, and this is a sample of young healthy participants, uh, but we found this in older healthy people too, is that we found a similar ipsilateral silent period that was elicited from each of these frontal and parietal regions, uh, similar to the motor cortex, but different in terms of magnitude and in terms of timing of this ipsilateral silent period, of this inhibition. So this showed that indeed, there seems to be a uh, strong communication from each of these frontal and parietal regions with the opposite motor cortex in young healthy people and in older healthy people. But more importantly, similar to our healthy control group, I found that the, there was this observable silent period in individuals with chronic stroke to, from each of these frontal and parietal cortical regions when we uh, do the stimulation over these regions in the contralegional hemisphere and to uh, a lesser extent, the ipsilesional side as well, the stroke affected side. So not only do we see these frontal and parietal inner hemisphere communication with the opposite side, motor cortex. But we also see that the, the degree of communication from these regions is associated with motor impairment and motor function. So each of these scatter plots, I know there's a lot of them, but each of these scatter plots are essentially showing on the graph on the y-axis, uh, decreased values equal more inhibition. So what we see is more inhibition from each of these regions from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, premotor cortex, and somatosensory cortex are all associated with less motor impairment and better motor, fun motor function and better grip strength, actually. So what this indicates to me is that these frontal and parietal regions are likely very important for recovery of function after stroke. So all this uh, work, uh, this particular work uh, um, tells me that targeting only the motor cortex with non-invasive neurostimula neurostimulation techniques is potentially a, a bit too simplistic. And I uh, posit to you that, uh, propose to you that executive function, motor planning, and sensory feedback cortical areas should be, also be a focus of non-invasive neurostimulation as an adjunct therapy in stroke rehabilitation, and in fact, uh, of assessment after stroke as well. So with that, uh, I'll finish, and I hope that uh, I've shown you some uh, convincing evidence for enhanced knowledge of neuroplasticity uh, due to motor learning, the use of interventions like acute exercise and repetitive TMS in both healthy people and in individuals with stroke and Parkinson's disease as well. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you to, uh, to of course, the funding that makes up, made all this work possible, my collaborators, and of course, the University of Montreal and, uh, and uh, CIUGM as well, and my affiliations. So thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you so much, Jason, for a wonderful talk. There was just so much uh, in there, and of course, I've got a million and one questions. So we're going to transition over to the uh, Q and A segment of of the hour. And just to uh, mention to everyone, um, I, I didn't do this at the top of the hour, but uh, the game plan is that we'll have a, a Q and A session now, and then. Uh, We'll see how, how the questions go, and uh, if there are tons of questions, we might uh, bleed in a little bit into the, the next segment, which is the roundtable discussion. But I do want to make sure that we get a chance to, to have our roundtable panelists uh, participate as well. So I think with that, Wendy, um, you were going to monitor the chat. Do you have instructions for us all? No, it's just if anyone has any questions, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, I, I see we don't have any questions at the moment, um, but we'll give a, a couple minutes uh, for people to enter their questions. Okay, well, I do have many, so <laughs> if you <laughs> might just uh, lead off and uh, maybe warm up the, the crowd with uh, a few questions. Um, so I was really uh, very interested in, you know, the motor skill integration and one of the sort of parting uh, lessons that you left us with was, you know, it's, it's more than just motor cortex and there are a lot of uh, other brain regions and other um, domains of processing that are, are required. But just mm -hmm. like from the outset, so that may be, um, you know, the evidence that comes from the stroke work that you've done, but just in general with healthy young adults, healthy older adults, I just think, you know, with your paradigms, there is really a uh, 
sensory motor integration in, in all of the paradigms, it seems, right? You don't have people with eyes closed simply doing a, a motor task of some sort. So I guess my question is, um, uh, apart from the stroke work, have you looked at healthy young and older adults and stimulating other brain regions kind of within that same um, original paradigm to, to look at the MEPs? Right. Uh, so that original paradigm at the very beginning with the motor yeah. motor learning. Yeah, actually, no, that's a that's a great point. And I absolutely agree with you. Uh, and that's actually a, a large part of the uh, of the NSERC funding for the oh, future. Right. So that's uh, that's exactly what I what I plan to do, because you're absolutely right. In fact, you know, the most when I first um, started presenting that particular project on, on the motor learning, um, you know, most of my most common question was, well, don't you think that this is all just a, a cerebellar thing? What's the role of the cerebellum communicating with the motor cortex? Because there's been, there's plenty of other work to show that the communication between the cerebellum and the motor cortex is certainly um, affected uh, as you learn these types of motor tasks. So absolutely, I think that the cerebellum is likely involved sensory, to a certain degree, absolutely sensory motor integration is involved as well. Um, um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to unpacking all of their contributions um, to it. I, I personally also believe that the premotor cortex is likely quite involved in this particular effect, uh, just because of previous results showing that the premotor cortex is quite active uh, during this particular task. But um, I'm, I'm quite interested in investigating actually all of those, because I think, uh, because I think it's very important to understand yeah. each of these regions. Yeah, relative contributions. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Well, it sounds like you've got more than enough for a five-year grant, so <laughs> we're gonna be good. Um, I'm seeing some questions coming up in the Q and A box, so um, I'll just read these out. So Richard Cortemange, um asks, "How does the short interval intracortical inhibition, uh, paired pulse timing, relate to alpha or beta waves present in the human motor cortex?" Okay. So, sorry, could you repeat that again? How does the SICI relate to um, uh, alpha and beta waves? Yeah. So if you open your Q&A box, uh, then you'll have the audio and visual. But I, I don't mind reading them out loud for the audience. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I see it now. Perfect. Yep. Thank you so much. That's great. Yeah, yep. I, I clicked on the wrong one. How does short... Uh, that, that's, you know, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm assuming with alpha and beta waves, uh, we're, we're talking about EEG um, types of measures, which I've done a bit of, but I have to admit that I have not, uh, I have not done any alpha beta wave oscillation type of recording with EEG, except uh, the only EEG that I've done is uh, some amount of sensory evoked potentials, things like the visual evoked potentials, things like this. So I quite honestly, don't know. I know that there, for example, when you when you practice motor tasks, there is a either an increase or a decrease, certainly a modulation in beta waves uh, to show an increased level of attention. Uh, I, I do know this that certain colleagues of mine have, have found this, but other than that, I'm I'm really not sure. That's a great question, though. I'd be very interested in. Okay, sounds like it could be a longer discussion with Richard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Certainly. All right, thank you. So next uh, person up is David Grenet. Uh, he asks, uh, what the effect of exercise you observed in people with PD different from, oh, was the effect different from in older adults and was the effect different in people with different levels of disease severity? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, the, the two studies that I showed you were uh, different in their design in the sense that uh, first off the uh, a study with Parkinson's disease was a three-month aerobic exercise program. So we did these measures before and then after the three-month program, whereas pretty much all of the other uh, studies that I, that I shared with you, including the healthy older people, was a single acute bout of exercise. So within the same day, the TMS measures were performed before and after the acute bout of exercise. So that's different than the, uh, than the PD study. Um, however, they were similar uh, effects in the sense that, well, the healthy older people showed very robust increase in corticospinal excitability, and, and the people with PD, not necessarily truly an increase, but more like a maintenance of corticospinal excitability. And the truth is, is that, um, uh, um, that that's research I look forward to doing as well, looking at the acute effects of exercise 
uh, of, of these types of effects in people with Parkinson's disease. As for the question on the, the disease severity, we had about, um, you know, 13, 15 people per, per group. So I haven't done any analysis on the different people with the uh, different disease severities. Of, of course, there are people with mild to moderate, so there is a variation there, but I haven't done that analysis. So that is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the, the uh... Well, okay, Richard is coming back with another question. Which layers of the cortex do you think includes the inhibitory interneurons tested by your methods? Uh, layers two and three, have these been identified in the primate model? Uh, would these show interesting firing patterns after electrical stimulation? <laughs> that's, that's a really interesting question. That's really cool. I like this interface too, by the way. It's a, it's, it's a cool way to interact. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I don't I'm not aware of any work that has, you know, specific, specifically identified uh, where these particular inter interneurons are within the, the motor cortex. Uh, however, layers two and three uh, do make the most sense to me. Uh, certainly, uh, they, they wouldn't necessarily be right to the right to the surface, but perhaps actually layers uh, four uh, uh, that would probably be going too deep. So layers two and three, I think, have has has been posited as a place where these particular interneurons are and perhaps these intracortical circuits as well. Um, have they been identified in the primate model? I'm, I'm not certain, actually. That, that is a really good question. Do they, would these show different firing patterns with electric stimulation? Perhaps, perhaps they would. It, it, would, be, it would be really interesting because it's, it's a really open question, you know, uh, how, if we, if we can and how we can identify these particular different interneurons within a primate and to confirm their existence too, right? To confirm that we could get a similar effect in uh, in a primate model, that would be that would be really really interesting. Great. So the next question, um, thanks for that, um, is from Ella. Uh, thanks for your interesting talk. How, in your opinion, um, use dependent plasticity is different or similar to adaptation learning? What should be our insights from the observation that gains in performance following adaptation learning? are very short-lived? Wow, that's, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, super, uh, super great question. The, you know, it, the, the use-dependent plasticity versus uh, adaptation, how they're similar and different, this, uh, that's another question that I would like to specifically investigate with these uh, different interneurons within the motor cortex, because I specifically looked at sequence learning, you know, basically being able to learn a sequence versus uh, uh, not being able to uh, do, practicing a random sequence practice task that you can't learn, but I, I haven't uh, distinguished between use-dependent plasticity, which would be more so just practicing a task that you know that you can do, kind of like we were describing before at the beginning, like thumb adaptation, uh, thumb abduction uh, task, for example, versus adaptation task, like the one I showed you, the visual motor adaptation task. Um, I think that there would be a certain amount of overlap. If, if I had to hypothesize, I would think that we would find something similar to uh, to what to what I found in the sense that the adaptation learning would likely involve the AP more so, perhaps the AP sensitive interneurons, whereas the use dependent plasticity would be more the PA sensitive interneurons and, and be more centered on the motor cortex. This is what I would hypothesize, um, but that's a really great great question. The observation that gains in performance following adaptation learning is very short-lived. Yes, yes, that's true too. That's another great question because because the timing and, and, and the duration of these effects, you really don't know. And certainly that's absolutely true. The, the adaptation learning seems to, for example, the cerebellar to motor cortex inhibition known as cerebellar inhibition. That seems to happen right away when we're, we're performing these types of vision motor adaptation tasks and they're short-lived like Ella said, so that's, uh, that's a really great point. And I think that that's really, you know, needed for future investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, a couple of more, and then I think we'll transition over to the round table. So sure. uh, Nader is asking, uh, in interhemispheric competition model, what is the evidence for those uh, neurostimulation ROIs in the brain? For example, is the DTI for those proof uh, or some other kinesiology measurements? 
Um, hmm. I'm not sure I quite understand the, the, the question. Is the nervous for competition model, what is the evidence of those ROIs in the brain? Um, he also well, uh, indicated, for example, is that DTI for those prove or some other kinesiology measurements? Right. Okay. Um, well, I, I think I think if I'm understanding the question is is the DTI uh, proof uh, or or something like this for other kinesiology like like clinical uh, yep. behavioral types of measures perhaps yeah yeah okay um, well I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're that they're proof but uh, but the fact that we we showed that some of these you know for the, the corpus callosum subregions those frontal regions for example they were nicely related um, to motor, clinical measures of, of motor function in people with chronic strokes, certainly of the upper limb, and uh, impairment, for example. So I think that, that this can give us some insight of the importance of these, of these regions, but I think a lot more work would have to be done to, to understand exactly what, uh, there's so many questions in terms of uh, doing these types of DTI measures to understand how the structural integrity of one region speaking or communicating with another may relate to other types of kinesiology types of, of measures and other types of behavioral and, and functional measures as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that there's evidence that we certainly need to continue to, uh, to investigate them for sure. Absolutely. Okay, final questions from Marciano. Uh, do you expect to see a similar pattern in the stroke population with regards to balance and gait as you did with the grip strength upper limb tests? I wonder about the functional outcomes of finer movements versus larger movements, such as walking. Mm. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So that's in regards to um, some of the last uh, study that, that, I, that I was uh, sharing. That, that's a great question, yeah, because I mentioned the grip strength there. Um, it's hard for me to, to really hypothesize that only because, uh, hypothesize about that only because I focus on the upper limbs and, and uh, I imagine that there could be these types of relationships, but I do imagine that there would be, at least with TMS, there would be a lot more practical um, issues and problems trying to do these types of measures. Only because if we're talking about walking, we know that the uh, you know the, the lower limb representations are a lot more towards the center, uh, are essentially in the longitudinal sulcus. So it would be really difficult to understand the uh, when we stimulate right there, are we eliciting the communication from you know one hemisphere or the other for example and um, I would imagine that there would be uh, similar patterns perhaps but walking is a different thing with central pattern generators and things like this and uh, I, I think that there would have to be maybe some other methods to do that other than TMS um, to, to complement to, to figure it out but that, that is a really good uh, that's a really good question I think uh, one step in between the you know, finer movements of the hand, for example, to the legs could be, you know, proximal muscles like shoulder muscles, full, full arm reaching movements, and we could confirm that these same effects that I, that I found would be uh, similar for the more proximal muscles like that. Might mm -hmm. be a good first step. Yeah.